Uh, what drew me to music in the first place um, goes right back for me when I was very small. I was uh, seven, eight years old, and my mum and my dad at home used to have parties there. My dad was always the one that made sure that the music was flowing all night. It got to a point where uh, one night, um, mum and dad was having another party at home, and I kind of came out of bed and I was down the banisters and I was kind of looking through in the front room and see everyone getting down to Aretha Franklin and James Brown and stuff and I'm kind of sitting there going, oh, this looks all right, you know? And um, my dad saw me and he said, oh, you know, you should either go to bed or come down and put some records on. I thought, I'm not going to bed. <laughs> I'm going to go downstairs. I'm going to put these records on. At the time, there was a record player. It was, uh, it would play LPs, of course, 45 inch records. Each record that was uh, selected and what was played, um, my mum and dad's friends were reacting and dancing and, and enjoying. And I'm thinking, this is all right. So I've got another selection of records, I put them on, and the same thing applied. I've got another selection of records, put them on, the same thing applied. So for me, that was kind of like my entry, entry level to, to DJing from that point, by not even knowing I was doing it. It was just something that I saw it as fun. So I kind of was brought up with a very eclectic ear, you know, based on what my, my dad enjoyed in the sense of the music. So that's how I kind of got introduced to the music. Anything at that time appealed to me, whether, whether it was um, singing hymns at school, whether it was me listening to music on the radio at that time. And we're talking uh, 70, early 70s. At the time, the music was predominantly um, soul music and jazz and funk, reggae and calypso music. For me, that was what I was uh, exposed to at that time. But also, I was exposed to glam rock. I was exposed to heavy metal, anything by Pink Floyd, if you can imagine. It's some amazing times, you know, those early 70s, with the, the stuff that came out. So you can imagine my ears was like, oh my God, what, uh, what do I actually like from all of this? Many years ago, there's a, a friend of mine called Neil McLennan who basically produces music for the Prodigy. I worked with him in the early days at a studio called the Strongman Studios in London, in Shoreditch. And that most of my learning when it comes to studio is from him. Um, sat there in there many nights, just basically just just watching and learning, watching and learning, and and all the tips and everything that to do with studio studio work was from him. So I would learn something and then take it home and then basically make it my own. Um, so he was very integral uh, part of my my learning process when it came to producing music. I built a fully fledged studio in my garden shed at the back of the house. Uh, and um, I was very proud of that, that, that studio at the time. And then eventually I moved it out of the garden shed and then moved it into the size of a room, room like this one. And then had every single keyboard you can think of, every single plug-in and sound in it that I could get my hands on. And I was there for at least 10 years with that studio. So I had my hands on being inside a working studio, which I could elaborate on in a sense of me making music. And I've I kind of almost forced myself to do that. I've always been demanding from speakers. I've blown up a few in my time, I can tell you. Only because they weren't uh, not efficient enough. The thing is, you don't have to have anything loud for it to be good. It just, it just speakers these days, especially in the studio, studio environment, just has to have a, a really great presence. If you've got a really great presence from from, a, from, from speakers of, of what you're listening for and you get what you need from it, you don't actually have to have it really loud. Well, I've been working in Dave Carboni's studio sampling bar with Josh Abrahams and, and we were we were talking about um, what I was using before, what I've been using. Um, and every time that I I, I came, came with my productions from my studio and, and brought into Samplify Studio. Um, and Samplify Studio had the Adams here at the time with two completely different sounds. Like, completely. And I was like, what? What's the name again? <laughs> Adams, all right, all right, okay. Basically, the Adams sound is exactly what I'm looking for in the sense of the depth, scope, dimension. Um, not having to happen too loud to, to really get what I want because it, don't forget when you're in a studio and you listen to your music, you know, like our music is quite repetitive, you naturally end up to pushing it to go louder and louder and louder because you're getting used to hearing that sound all the time. But I found with the Adams, you have to do that. You know, once you've kind of sat back, give your ears a rest, gone back in, and then you put the power on the speakers, then really you get the full range of what you've just created. And if there is anything not quite right in the frequency, you've got to know about it. So this is what I like about the Adams. They, they are kind of pinpoint accuracy when it comes to uh, the frequency dimension. 
to such a point that I don't think that I've actually heard a better speaker.